Hello and welcome to the episode 234 of What A Fab Day. I am your host, Simon Mas. The first time the Beatles were caught on film, a couple of photo shootings and Ringo walking off the band are some of the things we'll focus on today. On the 22nd of August 1960, the Beatles, with Pete Best on drums and Stu Sutcliffe on bass, performed at the Indra Club in Hamburg, West Germany. Two years later, in 1962, the otherwise routine lunchtime concert at the Cavern Club in Liverpool acquired a particular significance on this date. Granada Television sent a crew to film the Beatles in action and put together a TV special on the band for their program Know the North. This was to be the first TV appearance for the lads, and it was the direct result of the letters of their fans to the management of the Manchester-based production firm. The Beatles were filmed performing two songs, Some Other Guy and a medley of Kansas City and Hey 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 Hey. Coming after just six days from the sacking of Pete Best, detailed in episode 228 of this very podcast, the film caught a male fan screaming, We want Pete! at the end of Some Other Guy. The resulting film was left unused for some time, due to the poor quality of the results. The dark atmosphere of the Cavern Club didn't help the filming, and the footage was deemed unfit for use and shelved. More importantly, the footage had to be used with that of a brass band, but they wanted to receive the standard union rate to have their performance televised, and that was quite a bit of money with 50 members to pay. The film partially resurfaced more than a year later, when Beatlemania was in full swing. Some Other Guy was broadcast on the 6th of November 1963 on Granada's evening program, seen at 6.30. In the evening, the Beatles returned to the Cavern Club to perform for an evening dance night. In 1963, the Beatles and photographer Robert Freeman were at the Southern Independent Television Center in Southampton at around lunchtime. The band had to film a mimed performance of She Loves You to be broadcast in the south of England in the evening, between 5.55 and 6.40 pm, during the day-by-day -day show. This was probably the day Freeman shot the memorable photograph that was to grace the Beatles' second album cover. It was shot in black and white in the dining room of the band's hotel, with dark maroon velvet curtains for background and just natural light. For the job, Freeman was paid £75, pounds, about £1,600 in 2020 money, three times as much EMI had originally planned. At night, the soon-to-be Fabs played another two houses at the Garmon Cinema in Burnmouth, for their ongoing residency at the venue. On the 22nd of August 1964, the Beatles performed in Canada for the first time. The venue of choice was the Empire Stadium in Vancouver, British Columbia. With 20,261 people in attendance, the performance was also broadcast by the local radio station CKNW. Immediately after the gig, the band took a plane and landed in Los Angeles, California, at 3.55 am. Their first North American tour conceded no time to stop and smell the flowers. Second North American tour in 1965, with the Beatles playing the Memorial Coliseum in Portland, Oregon. The band performed two shows in front of a combined audience of 20,000 fans. Before the show, the band met Mike Love and Carl Wilson of the Beach Boys in the Coliseum's dressing room. In 1966, in what was technically a day of rest from their third and last North American tour, the Beatles were in New York City, New York, busy with two press conferences, the second of which was dedicated to 75 fans chosen randomly during a contest. The tour had been going well at the box office, and yet, 
The decision of playing huge open-air stadiums in order to satisfy the request for tickets generally meant playing with empty seats in the venues, sometimes several thousands of them. As the show business magazine Variety noticed, the success of the tour was solid, if not spectacular or hysterical as in previous years. The Beatles could no longer sell out venues this big. The high stereo had perhaps diminished, but if so, not too much. Beatlemania was still going strong. The real problem was that the band had progressed a lot from their teen pop 1963 output, but the average fan was still anchored to their more top image. The real problem was that the Beatles seemed more and more tired and ready to move on. The second press conference, in fact, had been one result of such desire. It had been an idea coming from the Beatles, hoping that maybe their younger fans could ask something more interesting or at least different from the grown-up press agents. After the ice was broken, though, the fabs were subjected to more or less the usual song and dance. You can check the links in the episode description to find the two conferences written out on Beatlesbible.com. In 1967, the Beatles were at the Chapel Recording Studios in London to start recording Your Mother Should Know. The session, starting at 7 pm, had no recorded ending time, but judging from the expense note that Chapel sent to EMI, it had to be rather long. The Fabs recorded eight takes of the rhythm track, plus two vocal overdubs by Paul. At the end of the session, an acetate disc was produced from a rough mix of the day's work. You, instead, should know that you are instrumental for the continuation of this podcast and the completion of other music-related content by yours truly. If nothing else, drop me a line telling me why you've been listening so far and what you enjoy most of this podcast. At best, visit www.simonmas.com support and check out all the little things you can do to make the difference and help this little community of ours to grow. Thank you! The 22nd of August 1968 was a rather terse day. In the morning, Cynthia Lennon countersued John for divorce, denying all claims, made by John, of her ever having an extramarital affair. John did not contest Cynthia's narrative, and the divorce became official in November 1968. This wasn't the only litigation of the day, though. After one shouting match too many, Ringo Starr stormed off the 7 pm to 4.45 am session in Abbey Road, saying that he wasn't getting through to their bandmates anymore and intending to leave the Beatles for good. That even the easygoing and down-to-earth Ringo had enough of the tension within the band speaks volumes about the situation. Work on the new album had to continue, though, and so, with Paul McCartney on drums and John Lennon on bass, the remaining Beatles started taping back in the USSR, recording five takes of the rhythm track. No news about Ringo's departure spread outside the band's inner circle. On this date in 1969, the Beatles had what turned out to be their last photo session. Indeed, after today, the only occasions the four met together were strictly business affairs. The session took place at Tittenhurst Park, Lennon's new house in Berkshire, with photographers Ethan Russell and Montefresco, with additional pictures taken by Beatles assistant Mal Evans and some 16mm footage recorded by Linda McCartney. The myth says that none of the four smiled throughout the entire session, but this is clearly disproved by looking at the pictures. On the other hand, it's impossible to argue that the atmosphere was far from idyllic and friendly. Dressed in black or dark blue, with only George's and Ringo's scarves bringing a bit of color to their persons, the Beatles seemed aware 
that things might not go better from here after all. Join me tomorrow for a wedding, a couple of recording sessions, and the furthering of the three Beatles North American tours. For the moment, I wish you a good day and a fab continuation. Simon Mas, music you love.